Hello students, I'm Madam Phoebe from Mount Kenya University in the School of Hospitality, Travel and Tourism. I'll take you through the unit of coastal and marine tourism uh, and specifically uh, the unit code is BHT, BHT 3108. I repeat again, I've said I'm Madam Phoebe, I'll take you through this unit of coastal and marine, but specifically we are going to tackle on the topic, on the topic protection of the coastal and marine ecosystem. Protection of the coastal and marine ecosystem. As we all know, uh, there's a lot that needs to be done on our coastal and marine ecosystems that are the four are, are normally at the forefront to contributing to most of the coastal tourism so it's important that we understand which are these ecosystems and why should we protect them so that at least they will enable us to do what you call to uh, match tourism at the coastal zone and it will now come to us as the host community as the people in our country, Kenya, or even in East Africa, Tanzania, and those other countries that we need to protect certain marine ecosystems where these species of the marine and the coastal ecosystems thrive and find their survival in them. So our today's topic will be on the issues of protection of the coastal and marine ecosystem. So Lana, uh, as we start off, I'll first of all take you through some few introductory parts, maybe to show you the essence of tourism, which emanates also for the, from the coast and from the coastal, uh, that marine ecosystems or marine tourism. Uh, so to start off, I'll take you through specific issues on the issues of tourist attractions, which we know in most cases are the ones that pull uh, our, uh, our customers who are the tourists from those generating regions or countries to come up to our country because we have these diverse uh, tourism attractions which is mostly at the coast and that's why today I'll take you through those specific ecosystem system. We know them and we know how also we can protect them and also their importance. Uh, the key touristic attraction along the coastal Kenya includes beaches, beaches, cultural heritage, coastal and the marine based habitats or what we are saying ecosystems where these specific uh, resources or species are to be found. According to Kenya Tourist Board KTB of the tourists coming to Kenya about 65% normally visit our coastal zone, that is our Kenyan coast, making the tourism industry or the coast tourism, marine tourism, an important part of the city's economy. So, Lana, it's very important that we understand coastal and marine ecosystems play a critical role and they are to be protected for the longevity of their survival and longevity of the tourism industry to thrive. So coastal East Africa stretches for 2,900 miles from northern Kenya through Tanzania and Mozambique. There are few places on earth that can be much, uh, that can match the vibrancy and the, diverse, the, 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 the diversity of life found at the coastal zones. The region boosts a variety of landscapes. The region boosts a variety of landscapes, including mangrove forests, sea grass beds, the coral reefs, and the multitude of the islands, archipelago, which are normally also important ecosystems that need much of our protection because they support abundance of the plant and the animal life. Uh, so I'll take you through 
the specific definition of coastal marine tourism so that at the foundational level you understand why it is important to protect those ecosystems at the coast. Coastal tourism embraces the full range of tourism, leisure and recreational oriented activities that take place uh, uh, in the coastal zone and the offshore coastal food and the coastal offshore coastal waters. This includes coastal tourism development. We all know that along uh, at our coastal zones or at the Kenyan co uh, coast, normally we have a lot of developments that takes place. And in a nutshell, we say that those developments now are also impacting a lot of negative and most also can say positive too impacts to these coastal zones or the coastal resources because at one point you say it will be advantageous when you have accommodation because at least we'll have places where we can host our tourists whenever they visit our Kenyan coast or the coastal circuit. So this includes coastal tourism developments where we say accommodation will be there, restaurants, food industry, and second homes whereby there could be construction of homes whereby tourists can come and be hosted away from their homes, so second homes. And the infrastructure supporting coastal development, like we have so much of the businesses, big and small, at the coastal zone or along the coastal zone. And this also you find that all these are kinds of tourism development that is normally bringing the issue of coastal tourism, which now becomes like it has been multiplied. And that's why the multiplier effect of now tourism comes to be felt or is now beginning to be experienced because we have diversity, we have variety of certain businesses along the coast contributing towards what you call coastal tourism from development, that is tourism development, from accommodation to restaurant, food industry, so many of all those diverse activities or maybe tourism activities that will now lead to what we call tourism development. So when you talk about coastal tourism, it encompasses on all those areas together. Then we have the issues of the marinas and the activity supplies. All those now will come to the issue of coastal tourism, which embraces a full range of all those tourism activities, leisure activity, recreation, and such kind of a thing. Then we have marine tourism. If I'm to define that, it includes ocean-based tourism, such as deep sea fishing and yeah and yacht cruising all this now includes those activities which are normally done at the deep seas and all this now will encompass what we say all about the marine tourism which is a bit different from the coastal tourism diversity of coastal and marine recreation goes well beyond the typical beach sun sand and the C, tourism. Offshore-based leisure includes activities as varied as sunbathing, collecting of objects, e.g. the dead shells, fragments of corals, fragments of corals. All this kind of a thing that we say they are now diversity of the marine and the coastal recreation, which now it, it, it goes beyond the issue of saying that you're going to the coast just to have a sunbathing or maybe to have what you call enjoying of the sand, of the white sand beaches and the like, and also enjoying the sea, which is now the Indian Ocean. All this now, and we together with all those activities that are normally done along those areas, along the coast, or correcting of objects, and also having some photographic, like, uh, issues whereby you take a lot of photos along the beach, recre uh, recreation of fishing, and also cruising are a few examples of the offshore recreation activities normally done at the coastal and also the marine ecosystem or marine uh, tourism. So with all that then we now have the basis to understand a bit 
about what you had to talk about in this ecosystem because we now understand that those deep sea activities like creature cruising, deep sea fishing, like kind of a thing, then it now calls for that we need to protect such kind of ecosystem so that all such kind of activities which are normally done by most of our tourists whenever they come, then we'll be able to, be, uh, to have very nice places where tourists can come and enjoy their stay. So we are uh, their stay and also their view and their experience as well. Definition of the coastal uh, stroke marine ecosystem, it's also good we understand what's an ecosystem. And normally an ecosystem is normally a community of plants, animals, and smaller organisms that live, feed, reproduce, and interact in the same, in the same environment. So those environments whereby you have uh, these organisms, be it plants, animals, you know, interacting, living together, and also reproducing, then we say that's an ecosystem because we have those species having to thrive in the same area and they still have to benefit from each other. So we have plants, community of plants, animals, and small organisms that live, feed, reproduce, and also interact in the same area or environment. That's an ecosystem. And thus, now it gives us a real reason why we should then do what you call proper protection, conservation of our, our, our ecosystem, so that those resources and the species driving in those ecosystems can now find a better place to be and to live in comfortably. Coastal and marine ecosystem with their benefits, I'll now take you through specific, those specific coastal and marine ecosystems and how it's very important or maybe and the benefits calling for then much of our protection. Kenya has a rich diversity of marine and eco coastal ecosystems. As a, as a, as a, just as we've said earlier, we said these ecosystems are areas where we have plants, animals, small organisms, living, feeding, and interacting together so that they can have what we call a good survival or good lives in those specific ecosystems. But if you go ahead and destroy in those ecosystems, then you find we will not have what you have, natural succession. And natural succession is whereby you have plants, animals, actually living comfortably in an ecosystem where they are not actually deterred from doing their natural processes for life, uh, for life sustainability or life, uh, life uh, in the longevity. So you find that when these ecosystems then are well protected, well conserved, then we say that there will be what you call natural succession to these species, to the organs, for them to survive in the long term or in the, in the future, for even the future generations to find them in good state. So Kenya has a diversity of marine and coastal ecosystems, and these ecosystems include mangrove wetlands of the mangrove forest, the coastal forest, estuaries, sandy beaches, coral reefs, and the sea grass beds. And these are ecosystems that normally support a host of the marine and the coastal species. Without them, then you can say we don't have much to say about the coastal and the marine, uh, marine areas because these are the specific ecosystems that play a key role in enhancing greater survival of the natural resources and also the species which thrive in those marine and the coastal areas. The ecosystem constitute an important life support system for local communities. So we find that this ecosystem as well not only support the livelihood, uh, the survival or maybe the better uh, chances of species to thrive well, they also support the communities that live adjacent to those protected areas which are the marine and the coastal areas. So ecosystem constitute an important life support system for the local communities because they supply vital resources, they supply vital resources that support livelihoods of the economic development. Additionally, this ecosystem maintains the health, the health of the marine and the ecosystem landscapes and the seascapes at large. We find that when we have areas at the coastal, uh, the coastal areas or maybe the marine ecosystem, 
well preserved, well protected, we find that those areas now become, now show as an indicator. They become an indicator or the environmental indicator that that area is now uh, in its healthy state, meaning any species that is to thrive in that marine ecosystem can have a peaceful stay at that area or in that ecosystem. So if you find that an ecosystem has, de has been degraded, it has been depleted of its resources, then you find that it will never be able to support those species, the resources that are to thrive in those ecosystems. So it shows us, or it's an indicator of the health, marine, and also the coastal landscapes and the seascapes at large. They also enhance beauty of the environment, attracting more tourists to these coastal areas. Now, Lana, I want to take you through these visual concepts for you to understand why it's important to have this kind of ecosystem protected. Why? For one, uh, first of all, we are going to look at the interrelationship of the mangroves, coral reefs, and the marine life. Like in the first picture, the first picture, this one, I want you to understand clearly that when we are talking about the ecosystems, we find that in here we have different types of fishes. Huh? And we find that they are still finding their survival. They are finding their way to survive under the sea because of the support of the mangrove roots. Remember, Lana, this is a mangrove root. It's under the sea because we understand that mangroves normally are in two worlds. It, as it is normally at the intertidal waves, that is at the top of this ocean, and still it can survive underwater, which is that. Uh, that's why it's said to be surviving in two worlds. So these the mangrove roots. These are the mangrove roots. And you find that you have different fishes and other species of, uh, species of the marine, which are also thriving in here. So we find that Mangroves is playing a key role under the water. We have species still which are also relying on it so much to survive well underwater because they can clean on them and then they have other plants which are growing on top of the mangroves still like the, uh, the sea grasses and the like which are still to be used by the, by the, uh, those species underwater. We also have, apart from the mangrove, which I've just shown you the roots underwater, which is also dependable, it's depended upon by these species. We also have the coral reefs. We find coral reefs also all over, and they are the ones also which are also very important because they show and indicate that the, that specific ecosystem is really in good health uh, for other species to, sub, uh, to depend upon. We also have the issue of the marine, which I've now said it is underwater. So we find that those deep sea activities can take place because still we have those species still protected in an anomaly in a good way. So coral reefs are there, mangroves and the marine life, they are together interrelating. So that interrelationship of the mangroves and the coral reefs together with the marine life, which is because of the fishes which are normally found at the deep seas, still having to benefit from the mangrove roots, the coral reefs still benefiting and all that. We also have the sea grasses there. All these are interrelating. And remember, these are ecosystem surrounding water, underwater, surrounding underwater. Then on this second picture here, I just wanted to show you how coral reefs depend on underwater for filtration, for filtration. So we find that we have the coral reefs here. This is the coral reef. We are seeing it actually depending wholly on the mangroves, on the mangroves, and also depending still on the underwater to get its fill, uh, to be able to filter water and all that. So this interrelationship normally gives us a clear indication that we need to protect all this ecosystem because they help each other and they are really in support of the marine and the eco, uh, marine and the coastal to a regime development. Uh, still here, I just wanted to show you the difference between a mangrove, 
mangrove, this is the mangrove. You see how it has deep roots and very strong roots, which normally protect our, uh, the oceans or maybe the lands from getting washed away. So it protects when you have higher tides and higher, uh, heavy waves to, other, to the other land areas. So it, it offers protection, the mangrove trees. The other hand, on the other side here, we have this other picture, which is the seagrass beds providing food and shelter for any marine, marine animal like the dugons. They depend mostly on this. Whenever they are foraging for food, they come at the seagrass and beds, and this is where they forage for their foods to survive underwater. So those animals mostly endangered, they don't get out, they just depend on this sea grass, eh? grass ecosystem. So they are very important if they are protected. So with all that then we come to the issues of uh, about those specific uh, ecosystems. The other thing, if I'm to talk about the mangroves and their importance or their usage, Mangrove forests literally live in two worlds, just as I said, they live in two worlds, growing in the intertidal areas <coughs> and estuarine and estuarine mouths between the land and the sea. So you find that these mangroves, since they live in two worlds, it can actually support life at the top of the intertidal uh, sea areas and also at the estuaries, uh, estuary where you have the two mouths there, one mouth entering into the land and the other one into the sea. That's an estuary. And we find that due to this, then we find that mangroves now become very helpful. And if they're protected and well conserved, they can actually serve a lot of purposes along the, our coastal beaches because they protect the lands from the waves, strong waves, which come from the seas and the oceans. So mangroves are comprised of salt-tolerant trees and other plant species from a range of plant families. Mangroves also, just as I've said, they are protective buffer zones, which help shield coastlines, which help shield coastline storms and wave action minimizing damage to properties and losses of life from strong hurricanes and the storms. So these mangroves, if they are protected, we are seeing that they do a lot of protection of our, uh, of our properties and loss of life due to these very strong hurricanes and the storms that come from the sea and the oceans. So when the mangrove trees are well protected and conserved, then they play that key role of protecting those in the lands and also our properties. Sea grasses are homes. Sea grasses are homes. Uh, I hope you still remember the sea grasses. Sea grasses are these, and they're underwater. They're the ones which are used by most of those animals in the, uh, in the uh, endangered species to feed on them instead of uh, going to the coastal, maybe the beaches, all along the beaches to go and feed. They just feed underwater just for protection so it enhances that so we find that these sea grasses are home to thousands of small species of animals and protect and, and, and animals and animals including animals and plants including seaweeds sponges worms crabs shrimps marine snails the starfish sea cucumbers and the sea urchin all these are species small species which are normally hosted by the sea grasses. So if we go on destroying that ecosystem of the sea grasses, you can imagine the great impact it will uh, employ or maybe that will be impacted upon those ecosystems because we have so much, uh, so many of these species of animals, small ones, which are to be affected if we destroy the sea grasses. So sea grasses are very important. The other thing is that sea grasses also form Sea grasses also form important foraging grounds. Foraging grounds, and when you talk about foraging grounds, these are areas where animals, those are, which are endangered, and those that rely on those sea grasses, find or search food from. So foraging grounds for endangered species, such as dugons, 
and marine turtles. Dugons and marine turtles are most specifically the ones which normally go foraging on those sea grasses because most of the time they are mostly endangered. So we need to protect these sea grasses because they are homes of such kind of uh, marine species. So sea grasses also form the important foraging grounds for the endangered species such as dugons, sea turtles, as well as for the important fish species like the rabbit fish, parrot fish, and sajon fish. Mangrove roots, these the mangrove roots, which I say they are very important, they are very strong, uh, strong, and they do help most of the species to maneuver around doing their normal activities underwater. So, and they also protect, they also protect occurrences of what we call siltation and also soil erosion. Then we have the coral reefs here. This is the coral reef, which I said that it depends wholly on the mangrove trees or reefs to find its survival still underwater. Uh, so we are going to talk a bit about the coral reefs. I've taken you through the uh, seagrass and also the mangroves. I'll take you through the reefs so that you know how the mangrove, the coral reefs are important. Reefs are home to one quarter of the ocean's biodiversity. Oceans, uh, reefs, sorry, reefs, reefs are home to one quarter of the ocean's biodiversity, even though they are they only cover a tiny percentage of the ocean floor. They are very important because they do a lot of things that normally help when it comes to the issues of the marine life and also them, because these reefs mostly are depended upon by the host community or maybe the local communities to do other things, most especially on the issues of eco tourism. So they are homes to quarter of the ocean's biodiversity, even though they cover a tiny percentage of the ocean floor. Reefs also provide protection. Reefs also provide protection from erosion to coastlines and sand for beaches. So reefs also pro uh, provide protection from erosion to coastlines and sand for beaches. Recently, however, reefs located near coastal populations are showing increasing signs of stress. This means that they are being over overexploited. So then there's need for much protection of these reefs because they play a critical role along the coastal zone. There is, uh, the, reef itself, uh, the reef itself is actually a component. It's a component of a larger ecosystem. The coral community comprises a system that includes the collection of the biological communities, representing one of the most diverse ecosystems in the world. For, instance, for, uh, for this reason, coral reefs often are referred to as the rainforest of the oceans. Like the ocean reefs have immense economic value, economic value for the local community who depend indirectly on them for ecotourism and directly for them for for the for for that animal to actually swim effectively around the the reef so we have certain fish species which normally swim around the in and around the coral reefs so we find that this coral reef should be protected because it actually finds more of the fish species that drive on them to swim in and around the coral reefs. We have the coastal forest, we have sandy beaches, we have rocky shores and the sea grass. So here we have, this is the forest, the coastal forest. And then this is what we call the rocky shores, the rocky shores, and on top of it we have the sea grasses. And still, uh, if you can look further, further, further on, you can see the white sandy beaches. So you find that all these are ecosystems that need our, our attention to, for more protection and also conservation because they are very important to our, uh, to our tourism industry. Sandy beaches, rocky shores, mud flats, and coastal zone 
provide feeding and breeding areas for multitude of fish, invertebrates, and about 35 species of the resident and the migratory seabirds. So you find that, uh, just as I was saying earlier on, I say that the sea beaches, the rocky shores, actually play a, kit a critical role in ensuring that these species that thrive on them or in them find a place to feed, to breed, and then survival continues. So there is what we call natural succession of those specific species because their natural way of surviving and also reproducing actually are just well protected and well provided. So that is the reason why sandy beaches, rocky shores, and the mud flats at the coastal zone needs our much protection and conservation. Between October and March each year, hundred, hundreds of thousands of showbirds normally fly, for, for, uh, fly from their breeding grounds, which is the northern um, Europe, to feed on the mud flats of the large mangrove estuaries, mud, large mangrove estuaries of Lamu in Kenya. Uh, something to note here, students, coral reefs and their associated ecosystems of the sea grasses, mangroves and mud flats are sensitive indicators of water quality and ecological integrity of the ecosystem. And that's why I was saying when you find all this ecosystem interrelating in a good way and they are, uh, they are actually uh, an indication that these marine and the coastal ecosystem are healthy because the water quality and the ecological e e integrity of that ecosystem or of those ecosystems have been uh, sustained. So there's what we call sustainability of those ecosystems because of the, uh, the, 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 the ecosystems that are being as they are so that they can also enhance survival of those species that depend upon them. Then we have marine mammals. Normally when you talk about the coastal and the marine ecosystem needing much protection, it's because of these marine mammals which are mostly endangered and they need these areas or ecosystems for their survival. Like for instance, we have this specific species here. It's normally nom uh, a dugon. It's normally very much endangered and you can imagine it's existing at the coastal of the marine ecosystem then it portrays a picture that there is need for much protection of such kind of an ecosystem because these species mostly threatened thrive in them. We have this other one which is a whale. Um, these are whales. We find that these whales are normally also species that thrive in those marine ecosystems. And this, the second one is the humpback whales. Humpback whales. Now I'll talk about, about these dugos and the whales. We normally driving at the marine ecosystem. Marine mammals most, mostly common in East Africa are serenia, which is the dugon, whales, and dolphins. These are now the mammals that find their existence or they survive in this marine and the coastal ecosystem calling for much protection because of this kind of species that drive in them. Dugons are large gray mammals which spend their entire lives in the sea. Dugons also live, uh, it's also known that they live in warm, shallow water sheltered bays with, and lagoons less than five meters. This is, that is 16 feet deep. They feed primarily on the sea grasses and for this reason, you can imagine, sea grasses, you say it's an ecosystem, one of the ecosystem at the coastal zone that needs much of our protection because you can imagine it's been depended upon by the dugon to feed and find their survival from that. So with this, they, uh, they, the, 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 with this reason, they are sometimes called the sea cows, the dugons. They are called the sea cows because they feed on the sea grasses normally at the underwater. And we say that's also another ecosystem that will need much of our protection. Small numbers of dugons has been, has been spotted in Lamu, Archipelago, in the northern Kenya. So you can imagine if we do a lot of our protection to this ecosystem, then you find that also those animals, species, mammals that drive on those ecosystems 
will find a way to survive. Uh, the other one is the common species of whales include, for example, sperm whale, humpback whale, like the one I've showed you. Uh, there's also the bridge whale, that is the Balontella edeni, mink whale, killer whale, which is the on Onisera or Osinas, Oka, and melon headed whale. These are the species of whales normally found at the deep seas or maybe at the marine ecosystem. Uh, these are now the dolphins in open ocean that was spotted uh, in Zanzibar. So you can imagine protecting such kind of ecosystem and what is underneath it, then it portrays a big picture of how important those ecosystems could be to those big mammals in the, at the coastal and the marine ecosystem. Common species of the dolphin include the bottleneck, the bottlenose dolphin, which is the, uh, the tarsio species. We have the common dolphin, that is the diffenus species. The humbug, the one I've showed you, which is the salsa chenicena, chenicensis. We have also the, uh, the spina dolphin, the spotted dolphin, Franca dolphin, and the dolphin and the resource dolphin, and the striped dolphin. All those are dolphins, and they are also large mammals that are found their existence in the coastal and the marine ecosystem. Then we have sharks. Uh, this is a shark. This is a shark. And this is the whale shark. Normally sharks are different from dolphins and the whales. So it's good that you also know these are also under the category of the big mammals. Normally thriving at the coast and the marine, coast, uh, marine ecosystem. So we have, let's talk a bit about the shark so that you know who, which are these species or the, these mammals normally found at the ocean. Various species of shark and their relatives, which are normally called skates and rays, correctively referred to as chido, chinodric, uh, ch chodrink chedine fishes and have been recorded in the Eastern African coastal waters. They mostly frequently note, uh, they mostly frequently noted that these shark species are bull sharks, tiger sharks, and the whale sharks. And as you all know, you've always had those Swahili people along the coast calling them the Papa Shilingi in Swahili. So these are now the sharks, which I've said they are of different uh, species, like the bull shark, the tiger sharks, and the whale sharks. And they are normally referred in Swahili, Papa Shilingi, Papa Shilingi, or just Papa. Then we have the rays and the sea turtles, which we said they are normally uh, relative. Uh, the rays are mostly relatives of the of the uh, sharks. And this is now how the rays look like. Like this one is a blue spotted ribbon sh uh, ray, normally found under the sea. So you can imagine protecting such kind of eco uh, ecosystem where these species can thrive, then it portrays a big picture of how important it is to protect and also enable those ecosystem to handle those species that are to thrive in them. We have the sea turtle here. That is the sea turtle, which is called the green turtle. Normally, it's found also the underwater, and it's also one of the mammals that are to be found at the coastal and the marine ecosystem. A variety of the rare species are found in East Africa waters. One is the ribbon-tailed stingray, an attractive marine aquarine trade fish, popular based in its, uh, because of its small size and also its brilliant color pattern. It has a very beautiful pattern, and most people use them or put them at their aquarium as one of the ornamental kind of a fish so that they do what you call fish trading. The extensive catching of this and other coral reef species has led to the widespread destruction of the, uh, of the coral reef habitats. We go now to the sea turtles. The sea turtles have a complex life cycle with eggs being laid and hatched on the beaches. So you can imagine sea turtles, sometimes they do mostly lay eggs 
and still hatch on hatch them on the beaches so you can imagine the sandy beaches also play a key, uh, play a uh, play a uh, big role in ensuring that these sea turtles find their way of succeeding or finding a natural way of succession uh the other thing is post hatching being pelagic we find that the sea turtles they have what you call post hatching being pelagic whereby it's normally done in the open ocean subtitle uh, sub adults resi uh, residing in co development habitats and adults living in the adult foraging grounds so with all this then you can imagine the seagrass the opens uh, the open uh, open ocean the beaches the white beaches they become very critical uh, breeding grounds or maybe areas where these turtles find their succession at different times in their lives also most species migrate between different foraging grounds and they migrate to from those foraging grounds to offshore nesting beaches during the reproduction or reproductive system so turtles this is what they do sometimes they go to those foraging grounds during the time of breeding and during the time of foraging so you find that these areas now which are now calling the ecosystem portraying or having a very critical role when it comes to these mammals like the sea turtles finding their way to survive and also to live in the long term so that is the whole issue about the issue of the arrays and the turtles five of the most uh, five of the world's seven species of sea turtles are found in kenyan ocean water uh, like for example the green the green turtle the, that is the chelonian meadas we have oxbill which is the eretmo chiles in bracata loggerhead which is the careta careta that is all those are now the species of the turtle which in most cases are found in our coastal zone the kenyan coastal zone or the kenyan ocean water so it is important that we pro continue protecting those marine ecosystem because most of the mammals are found to thrive in those ecosystem threats to coastal and marine resources and ecosystem that now later on will call for or make uh, now people to realize the importance of doing much of their conservation and protection of this ecosystem and resources one of the most uh, important threat maybe to know or to realize about is the environmental pollution environmental pollution is something that has caused much of the threats to these coastal and marine resources and ecosystem because we find that people cut down like for example the mangrove trees are cut down so that people can have space space to do what you call other developments like for example construction of hotels uh, all those kind of accommodation and other entertainment places where tourists can come and uh, actually enjoy by but though by doing all these we cause what you call environmental pollution because there will be a lot of erosion and siltation that now will be coming from the oceans going to those other ecosystems destroying and depleting the natural resources and the species that are to drive there also are washed away or maybe they are also denied their areas to survive or their natural areas to to habit uh, they ha they they find as their own natural habitation we have increase in human population that's another thing which has which is our, which has posed a lot of challenge to our coastal and marine resources and ecosystem increase of human population one we find that there is that massive increase increase of the increased number of people at the coast or maybe those living adjacent to the ecosystem which is the marine ecosystem we find that due to that increase so many people tend to move closer and closer to the uh, ocean uh, doing what you call other practices which are malpractices of course to causing more of threats and danger to our marine and coastal resources and ecosystem so human increment causes a lot of threats to our coastal habitats or to a coastal ecosystem and sustainability and sustainable infrastructural development it's also another threat 
whereby we have that unsustainable way of doing things, of constructing, of doing development that now poses a greater challenge to more of the coastal and marine development and conservation. It's because these ecosystem and resources, due to the unsustainable infrastructural development, then these resources get depleted of, for example, cutting down of trees to construct other infrastructure, like, for example, hotels, lodges, places where tourists maybe can be hosted, then poses a challenge because you have those infrastructural development are uh, actually denying the, uh, the natural habitation of some species which were to thrive in those areas where there is what you call infrastructural development. We have unsustainable harvesting of resource species, which I can say it's over exploitation, whereby you overuse something which is now becoming an unsustainable kind of harvesting of a species, which later on poses a challenge whereby such kind of uh, resources or species being harvested get depleted to an extent that it's very hard to be reintroduced back or maybe to be brought back because already they've been used in a overused, this what you call excess, excess harvesting, which is over exploitation. And it's a threat to our coastal and our marine resources and ecosystem. We have human activities such as recreational use where there is much offshore, offshore trash, disposal, and oil and gasoline spills. That is true. For example, when you talk, uh, maybe I talk much of the issue of pollution, eh? pollution whereby there is a lot of spillage of some waste, gas, oils eh? uh, from our machines, especially at the KPA. We find that most of the disposal, waste disposal are dis deposited into our oceans. And this poses a lot of challenge to our coastal and marine resources and ecosystem as well. Because remember, in this coastal and the marine ecosystem, we have those other ecosystems that are driving there. So if you go on destroying by those human activities, or like, for example, disposal of waste and all kinds of trash, then you find that those other ecosystems, like, for example, the coral reef, will also be destroyed. Those other human activities like logging down of trees and such kind of a thing, then it poses a challenge that when you cut down, for example, that mangrove tree to do other, other activities, then you find that's a human activity that also poses a lot of challenge to those underneath mangrove trees and its function underwater. So still, those human activities will pose a lot of challenges to the survival of those ecosystems and also of the species and the resources which are thriving in specific ecosystem on the coastal and the marine ecosystem. With all this then it's very important that people understand what kind of activities should be done and how should be, they should be done so that they are not done in a way that they are going to pose a lot of challenges for, to these species and resources that are thriving in those natural ecosystems, coastal and marine ecosystems. Due to this immense pressure being exerted on the Kenyan coast and marine ecosystem, we find that these resources are ever increasing uh, with the ever increasing threats, then we will demand our, 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 our ability, we will demand our consideration to ensuring that at least they are well protected so that we have the demand for the natural resources later. So with all this, then it calls for much of that conservation and also protection of this marine and the ecosystem resources and species well protected. Consequently, Kenya's marine environment, ecosystem, and associated resources have shown signs of degradation due to overexploitation as a result of and regulated use. Recognizing the value of coastal and marine ecosystem resources and the imminent threat, Kenya adapted the use of adapted the use of the marine protected areas, that is the MPAs, as one of the management strategies.
to ensure marine ecosystems are well protected, well maintained ecologically, economically, uh, to all ecosystems so that we have the longevity of those ecosystems to serve even in the future uh, years to come. So that is now the essence as to why then we need much protection of this ecosystem because with all that then we can really say that our country will be doing good in protecting those resources and ecosystem towards pulling more customers or tourists to our destination to come and have a view and an enjoyment from the coastal zone resources and also the economy, the ecosystems. MPS, uh, as, uh, as I continue then, I would say these are normally areas of intertidal and subtidal terrain together with, it, with its overlaying water and associated flora and fauna, history and cultural features which has been reserved by law or other effective means to, to protect part of all the enclosed coastal and marine ecosystem. So these MPAs are just institutions, uh, they're just places whereby you have history of the flora and fauna and other cultural features which are normally conserved in that area and, and also in a way to enhance what you call effective means to protect part of the enclosed marine ecosystem. So with much discussion of all that then we realize that it is very very important to ensure that our protected areas such like the coastal and the marine ecosystem are well protected and that's why MPA had to come in to ensure those mechanisms are put in place to enhance survival of those coastal and marine ecosystem. So learners, I think uh, to that I come to the end of our lesson. And I hope you've understood. And if there will be any question you, or maybe an area you did not understand, I'll be there to answer you. So as we continue the e-learning platform, I would expect much questions and interaction. Thank you so much. Continue taking care. Bye-bye. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era. And Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. Then, email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.